I think we should just go home after that, huh? Oh, yeah. Good to see you guys. He is risen. Oh, many of you probably know the phrase, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. How many of you have heard that before? There was a famous preacher back, I think, in the 50s who said that. It's Friday, but... Look, but let's be honest. We get excited about Sunday, especially Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. But I'm going to add a phrase that just kind of brings us back to reality. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, but Monday's right around the corner. Can I get an amen? Let's just, let's just be honest. So... You can, you can quote me on that. Now I'll go down in the annals of, uh, of famous preachers, adding to other preachers. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, but Monday's right around the corner. See, I want you, as well as myself, to realize that the excitement that we get to experience on a day like today is not just for today exclusively. That the excitement and the joy that God has designed for us is not just for Easter Sunday, not Resurrection Sunday. It is for the rest of our lives. But the reality of it is this. We're going to leave this place today and be like, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And then we're back to the grind, right? Work, family, friends, problems, addiction, sickness, whatever. My prayer today is that you would know Christ's victory is your victory. And not just today, but every single day. See, there's a thing that just came out a couple weeks ago called the World Happiness Index. Anyone read the World Happiness Index? So there is a group that measures happiness all around the world. Guess what the number one happiest country in the world is? It's not us. Finland! Don't they eat like gelatized fish and live in complete darkness half the year? How could they be happy? Guess what? United States, not even top 20. You would think that we are the happiest of all people. Because don't we have everything? Don't we have jobs and cars and and food? and, and, And let's just be honest, we lack for so little. And yet we're not even in the top 20 of the happiest nations in the world. Why? Because we have yet to figure out happiness has nothing to do with what we own. Happiness has nothing to do with how we experience, you know, the day-to-day grind of, of living. Happiness is connected with your creator. The creature creator relationship is the secret of joy. It was the great C.S. Lewis who said, if perhaps nothing in this world satisfies us, perhaps that's indication number one, you were made for another world. Right? We are here because there's a deep hunger and yearning within each and every one of us that says life is more than just my job. Life is more than just my marriage. Life is more than just my kids. There's got to be something more to this. And that's why this is such an exciting weekend, right? Not only do we celebrate a Savior crucified, we celebrate a Savior risen. And we ask ourselves, okay, crucifixion, burial, resurrection. What does that mean for my life? What does that mean for my life tomorrow and Tuesday and next year and 10 years from now? This morning, that's what we're going to unpack. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. We are taking a break from Exodus. We are usually in Exodus. Super excited to get back into Exodus. But today we're going to pivot. We're going to take a little bit of a detour uh, and look at, I would argue, the greatest chapter in all the Word of God. Romans chapter 8, if you're not familiar with chapter 8, you will be familiar with chapter 8 today. I hope you uh, go back to this chapter time and time again. It is the, it, I would say it's my favorite chapter, just like some of us have our favorite kids. Let's just be honest, right? There's certain days you just have your favorite kids. I'm not going to tell you which one's my favorite today, but there's one that stands out more than the other. So uh, if you have only one child, you're lucky because that's your favorite kid every day. But when you have three of them, it's, it's quite a decision that you have to make every single day. So I just, I kid. So Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, we have complimentary Bibles in the back. Norm, could you just grab a stack of those Bibles on that table? Anyone need a Bible? That's, this is yours to take home. So just raise your hand if you need a Bible. Norm is going to pass those around. So free Bibles. Come on, free Bibles. Who wants one? Makana needs one over here. All right, I see that hand. I see that hand over here. Michael needs one. Thank you, sir. 
Romans chapter 8. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. We're not going to look at the entire chapter. We're going to look at the concluding section of Romans chapter 8. But what do we mean by victory? The Bible speaks of victory. And there's two things I want to cover this morning. Victory is first and foremost believing in Christ. So let's start with this. That the ultimate outcome of your life is determined once you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You enter a relationship. We're not about religion. We're not about rules. We're about you connecting with your creator who sends his son, 100% deity, united with 100% humanity. And the moment you place your trust in Christ, the ultimate outcome of your life is determined. And what do I mean by that? Sin has been forgiven. Death has been eradicated. Though you may die, yet Jesus says you will live. Can I get an amen from somebody? Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection of life. Know why he did it in that order? Until you know the power of his resurrection, you will never know the life he has to offer you. Okay? So Jesus says, once you believe me, the, the outcome of your life is determined. You are forever sealed. You are forever secure in the Father's love. Why? Sin and death has been defeated, and you are covered by Jesus' blood and righteousness. And so we cannot minimize the importance of the cross and the resurrection. We don't worship a crucified man who showed that he wasn't powerful over death in the grave. He is risen again, and we celebrate that. If you want to go into a deep dive, we have this gift for you. So when you leave, go ahead and pick up a copy of the case for Easter. And I will tell you that until you deal with the reality of the empty tomb, none of the, none of the life is going to make sense. None of what I'm even talking about is going to make sense. So this is free, one per household. Take this. This is a journalist investigation into the validity, the veracity of the resurrection of Christ. Grab a copy of this, read it, you will be impacted. This is the event that has changed the course of human history. This is the event that has turned the world upside down. This is the world that has deeply impacted the lives of millions upon millions of people. And it is the singular message we continue to preach today. Why you guys look for the living among the dead? Do not look any longer. He is risen and ascended to the Father's right hand. And all who believe in him shall have eternal life. And so we will continue to preach this message. We will continue to get excited about this message. And I will tell you, it's not too much to celebrate it, even though there's still a lot of life to live. There's a lot of life to live for us. And I think about that game, that A-10 championship that just happened a month ago. If you saw it between Duquesne and VCU, did anyone see it? They're starting the second half of the basketball game, and the guys are out in the court, and all of a sudden the confetti starts dropping from the ceiling during the middle of the game. You ever seen anything like this? Obviously, someone pushed the wrong button, right? These guys are playing basketball, and there's a celebration already happening. They had to pause the game. They're sweeping up all the confetti and all the streamers. At the time, Duquesne was in the lead. Guess who won the game at the end? Duquesne. Was it too early for them to celebrate? Perhaps, but they ended up winning. I can think of that as our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, in Christ, you've already won. In Christ, the confetti's dropping from the ceiling. In Christ, the streamers are, the party is happening. Is it too early to celebrate? Never. Because here's one thing I know, compared to a basketball game where we do not know the ultimate ending, here's what I do know about our ending. If you're in Christ, the victory is yours now. So it is never too late to celebrate. So let's move into the second part. And this is really what I want to unpack with you over the next 15 to 20 minutes. While we have this knowledge, while we have this head understanding of the resurrection of Christ and the transformative power of that event in human history, how do we live with the assurance of this victory? How do we go forth knowing that it's Friday, but Sunday is coming, but Monday is right around the corner? How do we live with confidence? How do we live with certainty? How do we live with hope? How do we live with joy knowing that Things are still not the way God ha has designed them to be, right? We can live with victory every single day. You can live with assurance every single day. I'm not here to minimize your troubles. I'm not here to minimize your problems. I'm not here to minimize the things that you seemingly think are against you. But here's what I'm going to argue, that you in Christ are more than conquerors. And whether it's good 
or whether it's bad, you can use everything not as a stumbling block, but as a stepping stone to your development in Christ Jesus. Whew. Romans chapter 8. Turn there if you would. A couple verses, though, to get us kind of in, in this stream of thought this morning. The victory is Christ, and he shares that victory with us. So if you remember... Jesus in John 16, 33 said this. He just spent time with the disciples. He's about ready to pray with the Father, the high priest of prayer, John 17. He's about ready to be uh, betrayed and arrested and beaten. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. So here's a pretty audacious claim. Jesus says, in me you have peace, which means apart from Jesus... There's no peace. Now, there's a peace, peace that the world gives, but we know how short-sighted and how temporary that peace tends to be. Jesus says that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. I love the fact that Jesus is very forthright in saying, if you want to be my disciple, don't think you're not going to experience problems and difficulties. But you have to have a mentality that says, even when I experience problems and difficulties, Christ has overcome the world. And because he's overcome the world, you in Christ can also be an overcomer or a conqueror. John says in 1 John, so he writes a letter then, a couple decades later, to the church in 1 John chapter 5. And he says these words, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. So John's concerned about not only our individual position in Christ, but our, our position as a community of those of us in Christ, right? There's this thing called the church, the body of Christ. This is important. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now check this out. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. If you've been born again, you are more than a conqueror. Why? Because Christ is the first victor. He is the one who's overcome. Now all who are identified in him have also overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So now he says there is the king, the victor, the ruler, the sovereign. None shall stop his plans. None shall hold back his power. If Christ is overcome, I'm an overcomer in him. And it's faith that now links our relationship. But it's not a one and done faith. It is a continual trust and belief in him. What is it that overcomes the world? Our ongoing trust and faith in him who is the overcomer. And then John finishes with this, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So again, we have to be rooted in Christ. And we, we preach this message on Easter, we preach it on Christmas, we preach it every Sunday. Without Christ, there is any hope. Without Christ, there's no peace. Without Christ, there's no forgiveness of sins. Without Christ, there is no connection to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. And so, Christ has overcome. That's why even with no donuts in my system, I can jump for joy about this. Even with five donuts in my system, I'm telling you where, where I'm at on that spectrum. But it doesn't matter. When you have a relationship with God, it makes you. There's a, there's a spirit of excitement. There's this experience of joy that can only be has once you taste and see that the Lord is good. So, how do we, after today continue to walk in this assurance of victory? How do we, after today, continue to experience the confidence, even when life seemingly is against us, how do we retain such assurance of victory? I'm going to give you a phrase, and I'm going to give you five reminders of how to do this. Here's the phrase. Once you're in Christ... You do not have to fight for victory. Now you have to fight from victory. Write that down. 
Because some of you are going to text me this week, what's that thing you said on Sunday? I'm going to be like, I don't remember five minutes after I preach a message what I talk about, but I'm just kidding with you. Ten minutes. All right, so you don't fight for victory. The fight's already been done. You as his child now fight from victory. Too many of you are fighting for and you're not fighting from. And guess what? You look tired. You look hopeless. You look miserable. You're not one of those disciples going, hey, he's risen. You're like, I, I hope he's risen. I think he's risen. I'm not sure. Because you're not rooted in him who has been risen and remains unconquerable, unbeatable, undefeatable, indistinguishable from anything that this world has ever seen before. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't fight for victory. That's already been done. The battle belongs to the Lord. We fight from victory. Five reminders. Here we go. Look at Romans 8. And all these reminders pretty much can be found in Romans chapter 8. Starting at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? Well, what are those things? Well, if you back up to verse 28, we all know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Very familiar verse. Especially when Christians can kind of quote that when people are going through difficult times. I'm going to say, be careful, be sensitive, right? But I do want to come back to that because God's got a plan and a purpose. For whom he foreknew, verse 29, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So God's goal with you in Christ is to make you look like Jesus, which is point number two, becoming like Christ. As you fight from victory, because you've already believed in him who has been victorious, now the goal God has for you is to become like Christ. The immediate outworking of your life is directed. Is God directing your life? Here are the five reminders I'm going to show us. So he says, I'm going to conform you to the image of my son. He might be... uh, So that he might be the firstborn among many brethren whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he also glorified. Notice the the pronouns there, he. God is in charge of all this. Here's the good news. Believe and place your hands in the hands of him who's got you. Let him direct your life. God's in charge of this whole thing. And verse 31, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Ultimately, he gave his son, Christ, on the cross. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who is the one who justifies? Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, he was raised, who is right now at the right hand of God, who now intercedes for us. Christ's ministry in our lives continues to this day. He was crucified one and done, paying the penalty for our sin, bearing the Father's wrath, forgiving us of our sin, and giving us his righteousness. We had a good Friday service under the stars. It was fantastic. Oh, and one of the quotes I said in my meditation was this, Christ drank the cup of wrath without mercy so that you could drink the cup of mercy without wrath. See, this is what, this is what Paul's trying to get at here. He bears the wrath. We get sins forgiven. We get righteousness that's not our own. It's an alien righteousness that Christ has earned for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or or elections or uh, NFC champions or AFC champions or world peace or bridges that collapse or or nations that battle? What shall separate us from God's love? Nothing. Isn't it written that when the, um, for thy sake they are being put to death all day long and yet we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered? It feels like life is against us and destroying us. But Paul says, but in all these things, don't forget, we overwhelmingly conquer. You are more than conquerors. Which I'm sitting there going, how do you become more than a conqueror? We're going to talk about that here in a moment. Through him who loved you, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, basically he covers everything, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts today. Here they are, five things. Number one, 
And, and what I want you to understand with all these things is that you are not saved by the skin of your teeth. You ever heard that expression before? I think we as believers in Christ, and maybe those of you who have not yet tasted and see the Lord is good, God doesn't just barely save you. You are not paupers in Christ. It's almost like we come to, come to Christ and we think that just God hands out little, little pittances, pittances of his grace and his mercy. You are fully accepted in the Father through the Son. You have been given the riches of heaven. You have been given the righteousness of Christ. Stop thinking of your salvation as, yeah, I'm barely saved by the skin of my teeth. You are more than a conqueror, literally a super conqueror. So what's interesting is Paul's writing in Greek. And if anyone knows the word for victor in Greek, I, they got a free coffee. What's the Greek word for victor? Nike. Free coffee for that man right there. You guys familiar with Nike? I just happen to be sporting Nike kicks today. Yeah! I get no endorsements whatsoever from this. But Nike means victor or victory. And in Greek culture, the Greeks thought victory was impossible for mere mortals. That victory only belonged to the gods. And then all of a sudden, Paul comes along and steals their word and says, oh, you have no idea what Christ affords those who believe in him. It was stunning for Paul to write this word and assign it to Christians, this invincibility associated only with those gods in their culture. He says, this applies to everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's unpack this. What does this mean? Five reminders. Number one, God satisfied the greatest punishment to accomplish our victory. When Christ declares from the cross, it is finished, he has accomplished it. He did what we could never do. Here is the rudimentary, fundamental truth of the gospel. Every single day, people wake up around this world and they hope to make God happy with their lives. And the, the moment you say, I hope to make God happy, as far as I hope he accepts me, I hope he approves of me, that mentality means you've already lost. Because there's nothing you can do to make God happy or make him approve of you. Why? Because we are imperfect, sinful, rebellious, disobedient creatures. I know that's not the message you want to hear on a Sunday morning in Easter. But the good news is we're all rebels to the end. We're all disobedient. We're all dead in our trespasses and sin. But in Christ, he makes us alive. So what does Christ do on the cross? He earns approval. And now you don't have to earn God's approval. In Christ, you're already approved. Here's, here's, I don't have to wake up today and go, I hope God likes me. In Christ, he loves me so, so much. And when I root my remembrance of that in the gospel on a day-to-day -day basis, I remember that I'm already approved, and now I want to reflect his approval of me in Christ in the way I live, in the way I talk, in the way I treat my wife. I've been forgiven. I've been set free. And I can take no credit for anything that God has done in my life. All glory goes to him. Can I get an amen from somebody? So we have to remember tomorrow when we wake up, that the Father loves you unconditionally. You've been accepted in the Son. Here's the thing. When Christ cries out on the cross on that Friday, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We should wake up the next day and say, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? That is the cry of every single person set free in Christ. You no longer have to say, why have you forsaken me? Outside of Christ, you feel forsaken because you're far from God. But in Christ, you have been brought near because of his sacrifice. And now your song is this, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? Can I get a hallelujah from somebody? My God, my God, why have you accepted me? So Paul wants you to understand your acceptance in Christ. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. Go to the very beginning of this chapter. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He starts this chapter with this truth. God is satisfied, not in our sacrifices, which we try to do on a daily basis. This is what religion teaches. This is what spirituality of the world teaches. You have to sacrifice. But there's no sacrifice you can make. 
that is even close to the sacrifice that's already been made by the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself. So there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, all of our religious effort and activity, Christ has done by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. God has done this by sending Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemns sin in Christ's flesh. Look at verse 4. In order that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, he takes it, but we get the credit. Who did not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So Paul starts Romans 8 with this reminder. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Oh, to wake up and go, I'm free. Will I be free tomorrow? This is not a trick question. Is there liberty for you in Christ tomorrow? Yes. He has set you free forever. See, the world says, if you just have enough good works, if you just do enough good things, the problem is you can live a life of, of seemingly perfect attitudes and affections and behaviors, but at some point you're going you're gonna to miss. You're going to miss in one area. I was thinking about the swimmer uh, a couple weeks ago who set a college record for the 1,650-yard swim, Owen um, Lloyd. He breaks a record, and he's celebrating, and there, people are going crazy. He jumps into the lane of his college buddy next to him, but the race hadn't ended, and they declared him disqualified. He had swam a perfect swim, shattered records. And in the very last moment, they said, nope, because he celebrated too soon. And the face of him who went from I nailed this to I failed this. It was like that. Ladies and gentlemen, just the mentality that says I can do enough to make God like me means there's too much pride and you've already failed. You must humbly come to the cross of Christ and say, I bring nothing. He's accomplished everything. Nothing to the cross I bring, only to him do I cling. That is the message for us. So Paul starts and says, remember this. There's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Reminder number two says this. God supplies the greatest power to accompany our vi vi victory. So he then continues in verse 5 through verse 17 and says, there is a power now given to you called the Holy Spirit that Jesus says, when I leave, I'm not going to leave you uh, uh, alone. I'm not going to leave you abandoned. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Though you may cry when I leave, I'm going to deposit within your life my spirit, which is going to grow you and mature you and bring you continually into this fullness of experience of victory that I have come to accomplish for you. This is one of those areas of, of the journey that we tend to miss out on the power that god supplies god will never ask you to live a life he's not ready to empower you to live by means of his son and the work of the spirit and i love the phrase better the jesus inside of you by a spirit than the jesus beside you remember jesus says to the disciples you cry that i'm leaving you shouldn't because i'm going to give you a helper a comforter within you to live the life that I want you to live. And so that's verses 5 through 17. So look at that later in Romans chapter 8. Because here's what God says. I supply you the power. Now, let's be honest. I don't feel that power every single day. Sometimes I feel like I'm living off my own strength, strength and steam. And God is quick at times to convict me of this. I was reminded of this when I was trying to catch a plane. So I was flying to Slovenia. We have partners in Slovenia. And so we flew to Atlanta, to Paris, to Ljubljana, Slovenia. And the last thing you want to experience on an international flight, especially in an airport that's very foreign, is uh, that your flight is delayed and you've only got a short amount of time to get your connecting flight. Has anyone ever been in that stressful moment before? So, uh, and if you've ever been to Charles de Gaulle Airport, it is not a small airport. And we had to get on a plane that was like three terminals away. 
And uh, I didn't have my, my victory shoes on that day, but uh, I forgot what I was wearing. But the stress of trying, I think I had five minutes from landing and getting off the plane to getting three terminals away to a gate that I had to connect to to go to Slovenia. I am running through the, and I'm with others too, and I was the fastest of this group. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what happened. So I was running, but I'll tell you what. Every so often, there'd be these things in the airport, and maybe you've been on them, called a moving sidewalk. Aren't those the best, right? Like, you're like, oh, and then you get on those, and then you're like, okay, now, now I'm kind of cruising, right? And then all of a sudden, they stop, and then you got to, like, pick it up again. I think that's the Christian life. I think that's the Christian life. Like, you're just hauling, and it's like, man, I need a moving sidewalk, and God says, my spirit, oh, yeah. Right? And I love, and I even love, like, just a little bit of a walk, because you're still passing up people like crazy, right? That's life in the spirit, you're not always feeling like you're on the moving sidewalk with the Spirit. Sometimes you feel like you're hustling, but God gives you a moving sidewalk every single day. It's called His Holy Spirit. Trust Him. Rely on Him. Lean on Him. You know what I did? Just I don't think I've confessed this to anybody before, but I got to the airport, and they were literally shutting the door, and I was, I was minutes ahead of the rest of the team. I stood and blocked the door. And they, were, and they said, for security reasons, we need to shut this door. This plane is taken off. And I deliberately blocked them. I could have been arrested. But I said, my team is on the way. We got to get to Slovenia. And they were ready to just kick me out of there. Luckily, they come around the corner. I'm like, okay, here they are. We got on. So I think everyone was looking at me with snotty eyes to, during the entire flight, you know, because I was the guy that held the door open for my, but we got there eventually. So here's what I'm saying. <sighs> Stop and take a deep breath. The victory that God gives you is also accompanied by power that is beyond you. If you're feeling tired in your walk with Christ, you're leaning on your strength, not his. You're feeling a little bit burnt out. You're not relying on the spirit. You're relying on your own strength. Trust his power. Lean on him and come to him and admit it. Admit it and just say, God, I've been trying to do this apart from you. Abide in him, John 15 says. And he'll abide in you and you can do and ask whatever you want and it will be, a, it will be accomplished for you. But you've got to be with him. See, the work of the Savior, point number one, is unbeatable. The work of the, the power of the, of the work of the Spirit is unchallengeable. When you're in Christ, you feel unconquerable. Reminder number three, God supervises the greatest purpose to achieve our victory. Romans 8, 28. For God causes all things, all means all, and that's all, all means. So when you see the word all, God causes what? All things to work together for good to those who love God. This is only for those in Christ. You cannot go to a person who doesn't know Christ, who is an unbeliever, and, and tell this to them. But for us in Christ, this is assurance that God is directing everything that happens in our lives to a glorious, directed end that is beyond our wildest imaginations. You know what this means? You need to stop grumbling, and you need to be grateful. Can I get an amen from somebody? See, we think like, God, have you stepped away from the control room of the universe? Have you, have you turned a blind eye to my life and my existence? You need to understand, grumbling does not play a part in the believer's life, because if we truly believe what God is saying in Romans chapter 8, everything that happens should be embraced with gratitude. This is the secret of understanding victory that nothing is used against you. Everything is leveraged for you. That's why my mentality isn't, oh, that's a stumbling block. My mentality is this is a stepping stone. Your mentality, my mentality sometimes says that's going to destroy me. And God's saying it's not going to destroy you. It's meant to develop you. Write those two words down, destroy, develop. Because I'm going to argue this, your victory is already secured in Christ, your desired end is already controlled by God, everything now is used for your development, not for your destruction. 
please remember this. But you can only remember this, number one, if you've come to the cross, if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and you're empowered by his spirit. So there's a particular order here. Paul's developing this argument in Romans chapter 8. I've already shown you from verse 1 to verse 5 to now verse 28. God is supervising the greatest purpose to conform you into his son, and nothing is to be seen as a, a stumbling block. Everything is to be seen as a stepping stone. So anything that's an opposition, anything that is a perceived adversary, you need to say, God, how are you using this for my development? Sometimes we look at our spouse and we go, get thee behind me, Satan. Don't say that. <laughs> you need to turn to your spouse and say, how is God using you to make me a better person? You're not married to your enemy. You're married to your friend that God has given to you. You are, you are besties with somebody that you may not see eye to eye with and you may think they bought. Guess what? Everyone that has been brought into your path, everything that has been brought into your path is by the sovereign providential hand of God and meant for your betterment. Point number four. God sends the greatest people to assist in our uh, victory. Notice the pronoun that Paul consistently uses in chapter 8. We, we, not I, we, our faith is a corporate faith. This is my argument for the church. We need each other. And you know what? I, I talk to people, and again, here's the smoke screen we tend to, and, I, and I'm there too. Can, can I tell you, of anybody in this room, I've been hurt more by church people than anyone in this room. And I'm still up here telling you about how good the church is. I've been betrayed and have tasted the bitter tears of betrayal by friends and family in Christ. And I can still stand up here and say, we need each other. If you want to hear more about that story, you take me out to lunch. That's not a Del Taco lunch. That's like a Ruth Chris lunch. Just, I'm, just, I'm just putting that out there. So. But I will tell you that while you may give up on church because of they hurt me, they were mean to me, they're hypocrites, they're imperfect. I mean, you need to know that's everywhere you go in life. It's interesting how quick we throw it at the church, but guess what? There's hypocrites in, in, uh, in, in Apple. I don't see anyone saying, I'm boycotting Apple because all the hypocrites. Right? But when it comes to the church, the very people we know we need, we're quick to throw up a smoke screen and say, I don't, I don't need you. We need each other. There is this we involved where we do not forsake the gathering. This is halftime during a game that we are guaranteed to win, but we still need encouragement in the game. And we need to come together. You, need, you sit there and go, I'm tired. Well, Jesus rose from the grave. You can't get up out of bed. Let's go. Come on. Let's make this thing work. You need to commit to a church. You need to commit to a small group. You need to commit to opening your lives to people. Be vulnerable and transparent, knowing that you could get hurt. Because here's what I'm not telling you, that you won't. But what I'm telling you is when you have a group of people that are set on reminding one another of these things I'm telling you about today, that is a good group no matter how imperfect it may be. We need each other. And the one thing we can't forsake is the assembling together where we are able to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Your experience as a believer is not an isolated Lone Ranger situation. And you move mountains to be here. And you move mountains to be in small groups with one another. And you'll feel the pull of the Spirit to share things you've never shared with a person. Here's what I pray. You would find a community that says, we love you, warts and all. It took a long time for me to understand that. And especially with a lot of church hurt. But the freedom and being transparent and vulnerable and saying that my crap smells like your crap and we don't all have our stuff together. Guess what? There's something about the bond of the Spirit as the people of God that is, that is unbreakable. And I want you to taste that and experience that. The church is vital to our growth. Yeah, you're going to experience all sorts of people. Some things you may like. Some, you know what? You cannot find a perfect church. And you know what? You go to a perfect church, you're going to ruin it. All right, so don't go there, all right? So 
You're welcome here. Last reminder, and we'll close with this. And this, this is like, everything's building to this crescendo. God secures the greatest promise to assure our victory. What did we just read? We just read these words that say, wow. Who, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Like Paul is just, you know, it's just like a say less moment, one after the other. Like say less, Paul, right? Like, no, I'm not. Right? Look at who will bring a charge against us? It's already been taken care of in Christ. Someone's going to call you names. Someone's going to call you whatever. Like you are accepted in Christ. This is now your identity. How will he not also give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God justifies. Who's going to condemn you? Who intercedes for you? Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall anything in this world, shall anyone in this world? No. But in all these things, verse 37, we overwhelmingly conquer. Right? Here's the reality, right? Oppose us, accuse us, condemn us, separate us, defeat us. Never. There is always loss of some kind in earthly battles. But for those of us in Christ, we are more than conquerors. There's a holy arrogance here. It's not conceit, it's confidence that says in any victory, there's usually loss of some kind, right? You see a battle, you see a war, and you know, guys are coming out like, we won, but we lost soldiers. We lost men, women, we lost this. In Christ, you lose nothing. He's lost it all for you. That's why we're more than conquerors. And God says, you come to the cross, and then you realize that now in Christ, everything that you lose in this world to gain heaven is a, is a worthwhile loss. I count him the greatest treasure. All else is rubbish compared to knowing him, Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what it means to overwhelmingly conquer. Wow. Such a lopsided victory, what Christ did. Right? The cross, the burial, the resurrection. See, rather than driving us from Christ, these tribulations and these difficulties, they are meant to draw us to Christ. And all these things that we experience... In him, we have his permanent presence. We have his permanent power. You are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And what's the guaranteed future for you? Look at verse 38, 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall able, be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours in Christ Jesus. Wow. Paul would later say that the momentary light affliction is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. See, this is what it means to be more than a conqueror. Everything that is brought into your life can now be used as a stepping stone to development and continual assurance of victory in your life. Someone once said it this way, and I like these, these words. A conqueror defeats his enemy, but one who is more than a conqueror subjugates his enemy. A conqueror nullifies the purpose of his enemy, but the one who is more than a conqueror makes the enemy serve his own purposes. A conqueror strikes down his foe. The one who is more than a conqueror makes his foe his slave. Ladies and gentlemen, every single day, you can wake up a victor or you can wake up a victim. If you are in Christ Jesus, and your reminder that he's done everything for you, and then you can walk according to his power and his spirit, you can understand everything in your life is directed towards a greater purpose of your conformity to him, and you're surrounded by other people who also tout the same phrases and statements and beliefs and truths and principles. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing but security for you in Christ Jesus, that we can go to storm hell with a squirt gun, we can experience all life has to throw at us, but we are more than victors in Christ Jesus. Wow. My God, my God, why have you accepted me? My God, my God, why have you empowered me? My God, my God, why have you destined me? My God, my God, why have you surrounded me with great people? My God, my God, who could ever separate me from your love? I have victory in Christ today and forever. And all God's people said, let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the power of the resurrection of Christ. 
My prayer is in line with what Paul prayed. He says, I not only want to share in Christ's sufferings, I want to know the power of the resurrection because somehow the suffering for us in Christ amounts to joy. Somehow it amounts to this this certainty and assurance of victory. Lord, help us understand. Help us to experience that. Lord, and we can only do it with you and in your Son and by the power of the Spirit. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for these reminders. Thank you for the gathering that is happening in this place today. And I look forward to the next time we can be together. Thank you for the encouragement of the Spirit. Thank you so much for the comfort that we are able to have with one another. Thank you for being a great and glorious God and loving us as much as you do in Christ Jesus. To you be the glory forever and ever. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. He is risen!